Rip Snorter, eh? Okay. Final message. Exciting times. Just trying to get a good spot for that. Rightio. Before I pray, it's just a few people I wanted to just, I don't know, just say stuff, because I don't know if I get to say stuff later or not. And while my voice is going well, I've got to use it. So I've got a picture of different people. So Jaden, right up there from the get-go. Thank you. Legend. I don't actually, I've actually noticed I don't take photos with a lot of people that I spend a lot of time with um, that aren't my family. So even my family, I should take some more. So who knows when that was taken and why we got sunburnt faces, but that's all right. Um, yeah, just a Tonks. Um, it is. Just, this is more of a, what is it, message to leave with you guys as a church, just identifying some key people um, who you guys need to be praying for, supporting, lifting up. So the um, Tonks is an awesome leader. You've got an awesome leader there. But there's also a bit of a, when someone leaves, as a minister, when you do ministry and your key people leave, it hurts a bit and it's really annoying. And I remember when just even over the last... 15 months now, I reckon we've had stacks of young adults leave, and I had a stack of young adults doing lots of stuff with my ministry, other ministries, and every time one of them left, I'm like, oh, bummer, that really sucks, and you'd be down for a week, down for a week. They're all volunteers, so he's losing someone that does five days a week of work, so there's quite a bit there. So the main thing I want to leave you with the message there is just remember you've got an awesome pastor who's leading the church very well, but don't have, just think, remember the expectations when all of a sudden you've lost someone that's been doing ministry with you for 12 years, um, and then even longer there, if you look at, you'll see my timeline soon. So just remember that. Remember, he's got to deal with that and grieve with that. You've got an awesome guy in there, but don't think that he's going to be able to do everything quite the same way that because he doesn't have me doing those things next to him. And he's not great with technology either. So <laughs> I do make up that shortfall a little bit there. So don't just have these, yeah. Um, but you've got a phenomenal leader there that's going to do such a great job. But really get behind him, especially in this initial stage where it's a lot of work for someone that's been going with an associate that doesn't have an associate all of a sudden. So please, be praying for Andrew, be lifting him up, be encouraging him, be supporting him, and just ask him, what can I do? Is there anything I can do? Get behind him and say, oh, there's got to be some stuff that's not getting done now. And um, offer, you know, we talk about offering our money, but offering our time as well and offering, you know, being the hands and feet and as... When people leave like this, there's always great opportunity emerges. So there's great opportunity for people to step up and do ministry. The next one really sums up. Thanks, Jaden. Yeah, I don't have any good photos of me and Josh. I worked out. Um, and this one I thought was pretty funny as well anyway. Um, and there's another Josh there. So these three Joshes used to hang out a bit. But um, Josh Tonkin is obviously our kids' ministry worker. He's here a day a week. And he's also, for those that don't know, he started studying his diploma of ministry this year following his call of ministry, which you might hear more about later if you haven't spoken to him at a different day. But that's phenomenal. And um, yeah, he's been grown up in this church as well and done all sorts. And we're super excited to see what you can achieve, Josh, as you grow up in the church. But get behind him, pray for him. I know I did the same course ages ago and I didn't have any kids or a wife. Um, so, and I found it, you know, time consuming. So I, particularly pray for him as he's studying. Pray for him as he's studying and managing workload with his family um, and all of that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, just continue to get behind him as well. So these are just people to get behind. And the last two are two people that are doing sort of my ministries. Yeah, yeah, next one, Jaden. Thanks. And uh, this is Matt and Jono. Yep, I probably weren't expecting to see a photo of themselves today. So the two main ministries I've been leading, I could just go on and name so many different leaders today. But these two guys, so Matt on the, my left, it's up there as well, am I right? So there's young Matt. This is when we went. This was in 2017. We went to Movie World. We don't have a picture without the Joker in the middle, so uh, <laughs> together. So we might have to get one of those. I don't know. But um, these two guys, so Matt is running our youth ministry until, you know, unless another youth pastor comes along or in any of that sort of stuff. But he's a super guy who is, um, we talked about this at youth camp, so I don't have to say, to, oh, there he is, don't have to say too much. But get behind Matt, because he's a full-time working volunteer and he's now leading our youth ministry and he's doing it with the support of Georgie Tonkin, helping make up some of the admin stuff that uh, Matt doesn't love to do and because it's a big job. But um, get behind him as he's leading that. And Jono's also... Uh, a great youth leader, and, but he is also doing a lot of our young adult stuff, so heading up uh, young adults Bible study and driving a lot of that sort of stuff, so there he is. Yeah, so before you had a beard, mate, yeah. Um, so yeah, just be praying for all those four people, lots and lots of people. These are people to be grateful for that you've got in your church. People that I know are going to do a phenomenal job in all the ministries that they're called to do at the moment. And this may look different over time as time goes, but for the time being, as these guys are filling the work I've been doing with 
days that I've had allocated that church, they're now doing it. The guy in the middle is running our kids' ministry. Um, that's <laughs> No, he's not. Um, yeah, that was just a fun day. That was actually a youth ministry conference. It was uh, seven years ago now, would you believe? So that was when they first came and started as youth leaders, and they've been doing a phenomenal job ever since. I'm going to pray for my message and for those people right now, and then we're going to dive into today's message. Father, we thank you. We just thank you that we can worship you. We pray right now, Lord, as uh, yeah, we open up your word, that people can hear your words, not my words, that people can see you and not me. And you can help shape us into who you want to shape us today. I thank you for every single person here today. If they don't know you, Lord, I pray that they can understand a little bit more about you and why people follow you. If people know you really well, Lord, I pray that you can, they can be challenged in who they can be influencing, how they can be influencing and how they can be spreading the gospel. I just want to pray as well, just for those four people I acknowledge just there and the many other people of this church. We just pray for Andrew. We just thank you for the awesome senior pastor he is. We thank you for the way he leads this church, the people he's built up. And we pray particularly now over the next little while as he doesn't have uh, someone helping him do ministry in the same capacity that he's had for the last many years. We pray that you can really uh, yeah, give him sustainability, give him people's names that you are calling to fill those roles, give him strength. Uh, give him rest as well in that and just yeah, really build him up and put the people around him that he needs. Thank you for Josh Tonkin as well, Lord. We just thank you for his call to ministry. Thank you for the work he's been doing in the uh, kids' ministry space and every other ministry he's been involved in for some time now. We just really pray for him and his family as he is studying, as he's taking on um, yeah, that extra load because he wants to follow your call. We pray that you bless his preparation, bless his study, bless the work that he is doing. I really pray that he can um, yeah, just think clearly when he sits down to do any of that. And um, as he follows your call, that you can continue to shape him into the man you want to be. Be with Maddie and Grayson and Archer, that they can continue to um, yeah, help support him. But also, um, yeah, just when he's got lots on in certain weeks and there's assignments and stuff like that, that you can help really just give them strength as a family, Lord. Thanks for Matt. Uh, just thanks for the awesome heart that he has for you, Lord. Thank you for the uh, just already great influence he is of young people in our church. We pray that you can continue to work through him as he continues to help lead the teenagers, the students of not just this church, but in San Raja toward you. And thanks for Jono as well. Thank you for the um, passion that he has to make sure that there is something for young adults in this church. The young adults aren't falling away from their faith, but they're going towards you and continue to use him, shape him and grow him. We just lift those four people up to you and then all the other ones that I haven't mentioned, Lord. And we just commit this message to you, Lord. We pray that we can see you and you alone. It's in your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Rightio. So it's a fun day today. It's, um, hopefully my voice holds up for most of it, but it should be all right. But um, it's a bit weird too. People have been saying, how are you feeling? And I don't know how to identify how I'm feeling. Maybe a little bit nervous at times, but yeah, I probably just can't put my finger on the actual feeling that it is, but it's weird. So I'm preaching my last sermon as the associate minister. I keep saying as the pastor, because hopefully you guys want me as a guest sometime, and I can write off a trip on tax if I want to come on a holiday. <laughs> nah, just so I can be a part. But um, yeah, last message here as a minister. I remember just up here, I preached my first message. We used to have a higher stage. It was a daggy stage. We had this horrible wooden pulpit thing that we used to put tinsel around at Christmas. I don't know why we ever did that. And um, I remember it really well because there was a lady in our church, Gwen Curtis, who was sitting in that empty seat there. And I decided to preach on football. Does anyone remember this? It was in 2008. <laughs> nah? Yeah. So we decided to do a football illustration with an actual football. And um, we, it was, I can't even remember why. But anyway, we did it. And um, my stupid friend Gary, um, who still comes to this church sometimes, decided to kick the ball when I said, just don't kick the ball, into the congregation. And this lady, Gwen, had just been in hospital for a while. And she's first service back. She was at the end of the aisle in a wheelchair. And the ball just goes bang right into her lap. And for a moment, I thought, well, this is a short career in ministry. And um, <laughs> fortunately, she was sort of having a laugh. So I'm like, oh, phew, it's a good thing Gary can't kick, um, put any power behind it or anything like that. But I'll never forget, that was my first sermon. There's so many firsts here in this church. I got married right in this spot right here, probably this spot here, because I didn't conduct my own wedding, but, um, yeah. but that was where I got married. I remember somewhere around this spot here was the first time a young person came and said they wanted to be a follower of Jesus after I did a message. And I remember thinking, wow, deep breath. Okay. <laughs> didn't think I was capable of that, so I was, um, oh, it's really cool. Obviously over there getting baptised, doing my first baptism. Is there anything else? Did all sorts of different stuff. Oh, first funeral, somewhere up here as well when Tonks was away. 
So I've had all these firsts. So it is a bit weird emotions coming and doing a last. But um, yeah, it's going to be fun. But I thought it's also important to acknowledge my favourite barista in town. So I love my coffee. So my favourite barista in town is this guy called Dom. And he's been in a number of different spots around town. He's been at this Coffex place that was over next to Australia Post. He had one right near the church for a little while, um, just up the road, which was fantastic. Wasn't good for my caffeine addiction. Um, he had a van over there as well. He went, oh, he was in the back of a barber shop as well. He's been in all sorts of spots, just different cafes. As, as you know, cafes open. I'll try and speak slower soon, by the way, that um, helped me get through it all. Um, but the great thing about this guy is he knew my coffee order. He knew exactly what I wanted. He knew what my food I liked and he'd work out what sort of stuff I needed that day. So you look like you need some scrambled eggs with this. I'm like, yeah, OK, I'll do. He was very good at upselling. And... Um, all of this, and he was amazing. So he would see me walking down the street or driving past, he'd start making my coffee, and he'd have it on the table where I usually sit before um, I even sat down. I'm like, dude, this guy's good. He got to know my family, he got to know my name, hobbies, all of that sort of stuff. It's scary, the relationship you make with a barista, isn't it? Yeah. But then all of a sudden, he, um, at the moment, doesn't have a coffee shop. And there's sadness with that, isn't there? Uh, and I can't just go and get a coffee off him whenever I like. I can't go get the best bacon, egg and roll in town. And I've asked cafes to make the exact same thing he does. They just don't taste the same. I don't know what it is. He's got some sort of secret recipe there that um, can't be recreated at the moment. So I hope if I find it, I'll let everyone know. Because that's what I always send people for a coffee and bacon and egg roll. But so far, no luck. But I want to recap a little bit of history, just in my time at the Mildura Church of Christ. So I've got some fun photos for this little bit. So for those that don't know me, my name's Josh, I'm the Associate Minister, and I started attending here in 1997, when my family, my family moved up from Ballarat, where we dad pastored his first, second church there, uh, and he decided he didn't want to do ministry anymore, he wanted to be a chaplain. Now, it'd be cool to have some photos when I was a kid coming to this church, I got nothing like pre-18, so I told my mum to get that camera away from me as I was growing up. Um, <laughs> So anyway, um, I'll stick to my notes for this bit, eh? So, came to Mildred Church in Christ in 1997, and I was just a young kid, and I immediately made friends at this church with two boys called Clinton Waters and Mark Midgley, who are still very close friends to this day. So making friends with them and going to this cool thing called Adventure Club. And Adventure Club's still running today. It was on Tuesdays when I went. It looked a little bit different, but uh, not that different really. And it was phenomenal. And we had a thing called Children's Church as well. And that was basically Adventure Sunday. But um, yeah, loved it. So love going there. And I pretty much think me and my brother decided we were going to this church because we loved the program and made friends. And we wanted to go and see those people again. So it made it pretty easy where we were going to settle at church in Mildura. So that was as an eight-year-old eight and still here today. In year seven, I remember quite well receiving a phone call from our youth pastor. Our new youth pastor, I should say. Now, things started pretty rocky with this youth pastor in grade six. I was sitting just over there, sort of where Sophie's sitting at the back, sort of just under that crash sign. And me and my friend Clinton and Mark, we were playing Game Boy like we always did every Sunday before church. And as we were playing Game Boy, this new youth pastor turned around and said, now that Game Boy goes off when church starts. I'm like, who's this jerk? Just wondering who's telling us we can't. Then we find out he's our new youth pastor. We're like, oh, great. Yeah. But then, funnily enough, in year seven, I got a phone call, like actually on the home phone. He's got his Game Boy with him. Clinton, good job. <laughs> Don't play that while I'm preaching. <laughs> and he rung up on the home phone. I remember I'm saying, you got a phone call. Oh, that's weird. Didn't know kids got phone calls. And uh, it, was past, it was Pastor Tonks, or just Tonks, we called him. And he um, invited us to a Bible study that he was running after school. Uh, so I'm like, oh, okay, I'll check it out, go to youth group. I'd feel I wasn't allowed to go to a venture club anymore. So I start going to this Bible study, which then ran into youth group. And then we found out he actually had a video game set up where we're like, oh, this jerk that hates video games actually loves video games. And we thought that was really cool. So we started going to youth group. And I can't describe how much I loved youth group growing up. It was just like youth group would finish and I just wanted youth group to be there again. It was like the longest wait of the week, Friday 9.30 it was back then, having to wait until next week to get to Bible study and youth group. I just could never wait. It was just like, oh, I wish we were there now. Um, and that's why since then I've just about had no free Fridays because I've always been at youth group, except for very minor gaps in the holidays and stuff like that. So as I grew up in youth ministry, I'd eventually accept my faith, get baptised at the age of 15, just over there. And um, yeah, continue to grow up just loving life in the Mildura Church of Christ. Um, all sorts of stories I could share through those years, but I won't. 
But then in year 12, I remember I went to a conference at the start of the year. There's was, was all this pressure in year 12. They still put it on now to know exactly what you want to do before you even hit 18, which is crazy to think we put pressure on 16, 17-year-olds to know what they want to do for the rest of their life. But anyway, that's what they did. And I was thinking, and I remember hearing about this. I remember I said, I love youth ministry. And I'm like, this, this place is awesome. So I'm like, I just want to get paid to do youth ministry. And I remember being at a... Um, conference at the start of the year and oh sorry I oh, know I'm still on that picture am I yes I am all good Jaden I remember getting paid going to this conference sorry and I'm like oh I think I actually would love to be a pastor you get to make an impact on people's lives you get to tell people about Jesus that's pretty cool go to school that year I sort of forgot about it until they're starting to hammer you well, what do you want to be what do you want to be I'm like, okay go to the careers counsellor tell them I want to be a youth pastor they're like a what a youth pastor like at a church oh Oh, well, you can't do that. I don't know what you've got to do to be one of those. I was like, oh, okay. Can you think of something else? I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I just didn't think of it too much for a little while after that. I put it to the side. Love media studies as well, so I just applied for some media studies, basically just to shut the teachers up. So then we have 2008 to 2024. Again, they're all ending 2024 because that's today. Got some fun photos there. I actually took photos in this period of time. So you have a quick little uh, there. So this was our first time we did a carols at NAMA. Uh, that was a trip to a conference with the young Isaac Fabich and Josh Tonkin. That was our first youth camp at Camp Kedron. We just did our 13th or 14th, I reckon. That was me and Ryan Midgley at the time and a guy called Santa. Um, <laughs> he, we were running um, Adventure Club at the, uh, way back then. And that was our first holiday program, actually. So Sam helped me run that, um, who was still helping this week. And this was, we were talking about this. We did a skit with uh, those three people there that were the people in the, the skit, I suppose. But it was all science-themed. Very cool. And um, that was in... I think I worked out this was the 14th of that, too, or something like that, maybe 2011. I'd have to look at the folder. I grabbed the picture out. Yeah. But from 2008 to 2024, that's when I started leading at church. What I realised is my dad, well, it's not I realised, my dad wasn't very satisfied with the careers counsellor who said, oh, you can't do that, you've got to pick something else. So when it got to the end of the year, he started actually looking for things that you could do and he found this internship program at the Baptist Union, uh, through the Baptist Union, sorry. And I took it to church and sat down with Tonks and Ray Alabaster and they said, oh, okay. And we sat down and I said, oh, well, if you're interested in doing this, we really need somebody to help at a venture club. Youth group sort of the youth group was sort of in a bit of a spot where there was a bit of transition, so it wasn't good for me to go straight to youth group. They said, well, if you want to serve in ministry, if you want to do this program, you've got to do it at Adventure Club. I'm like, ugh, nah, I hate kids, that sucks, no good. <laughs> went away, prayed about it, thought about it, said, uh, you know, I suppose I can do it. I liked Adventure Club when I went, maybe it'll still be fun. So I committed to do that and couldn't tell you how much I loved it. Absolutely loved kids' ministry. Um, loved doing it this week as well. I uh, wish I got to spend more time in it because it's just a fun, high-energy thing and you get to see, teach kids about Jesus who ask just the best questions um, and absolutely loved that. So taking their advice ended up going quite well. So this led to the year after I started leading youth ministry. Um, it was weird. I was just there to help with Adventure Club and through the circumstance of who was leading it at the time, um, they couldn't lead it anymore, so it sort of just fell onto me. And it's just funny reflecting uh, back at that. And I'm like, wow, I was entrusted to some pretty big ministries when I probably shouldn't have been. I wouldn't have put myself in charge. But um, there was just opportunity available there at the time. Um, yeah, so I was, I was getting involved in kids' ministry, youth ministry. I was leading at church. Then 2012 to 2024... There we go. That's when I was on staff. So I'd finally completed my diploma of ministry and I was finally on staff getting paid actual money to do ministry work. I'm like, this is cool. Uh, a few different pictures. So this is just the different staff. We, that's our um, youth group. When we do the ice cream, we do this massive dessert night where we eat ice cream out of an old pipe. Um, probably not very sanitary, but that was pre-COVID, I think. Look how young all the kids are. Yeah. Uh, and then that was camp, oh, just 2020. Uh, so that's not the one we just had. That was a couple years ago. That was State Youth Games we used to go to every year. You can tell I found 2016 must have been the year the selfies were invented because uh, my face is in the front of all of them. That was the opening of our church uh, when we reopened in this room. So pretty exciting stuff there, isn't it? So, um, yeah, that's when I started properly on staff and two days a week turned into three, into four and eventually in 2020 full time, mostly because they needed some technology. Somebody knew a little bit about tech so that we could still have church. So the opportunities I was given at this church have set me up really well. 
many of the opportunities, I was, as I just said, I was given before I really should have had the opportunities. And it was just because there was sort of gaps in those particular places at the time. And I look back and think, well, obviously, that's why I was feeling that calling, because someone was needed to fill those holes at the time. I've got no doubt that God was leading and preparing me for that because of those opportunities. I've been giving so much grace in this time. I'd like to say I'm leading like I am today and I did an awesome job throughout the, um, since 2008, leading all those different ministries. But the reality is I was a bit cheeky. I was a bit um, pig-headed. I was a bit, uh, what's the word? Don't even know what the words would be, but I was probably a loose goose, a bit of a loose cannon. Maybe that's it. But um, so I grew up and I was shaped during that time and learnt lots. But I was given the opportunity to lead and I was given lots and lots of grace, grace from leaders at the church. Grace from parents who actually let me be responsible for their kids' lives on Friday and Tuesday and camps and all that sort of stuff. And um, grace from God, ultimately, during this time. So I'm not just telling you this for the sake of it. I tried to link it into a sermon. But um, as I reflect on my journey today, there's a ten- I'm looking for attention. I'm thinking, oh, what, what have I learned from this today? See, discipleship cannot happen from one person. Or we cannot effectively... Be, we cannot be effectively discipled by one person. If we've just got one person who's the main person discipling us in our life, our faith probably won't last that well. When someone's faith is shaped and developed through one key figure in a person's life, I don't think it'll last. We need to recognise that we're all just playing a part in a person's life. We're not the whole soul end game for somebody becoming a follower of Jesus. We do what we can to be the best part that we can be but it's all just being a part of making up somebody else's faith and discipleship. You see, it's, there's statistics now and data, particularly the stuff I get from the Fuller Youth Institute. They're doing a lot of research about, they're calling it like the sticky faith project, but how people, there's this big drop-off of people who stop following Jesus after the age of 18. And they're trying to work out, well, how do we stop that and what are the keys to that happening differently? And what they're finding is people that have multiple people as an influence of faith or a teacher of faith or a discipler in their life are far more likely to actually stick to their faith than people who might only have one or two key figures in their life. So when I was a part of this church's youth group as a student, I saw many people come to follow Jesus. We had a pretty big youth group when I was in it. And there was a period of time, I remember we had like just baptism after baptism. I think we had uh, 11 baptisms in nine weeks or something like that. Like there was so much fruit coming out of our ministry. And I have no doubt at all that they were genuine commitment. They were genu- friends that genuinely loved and, f- and followed Jesus. But the sad reality is for a lot of people that I went through church with as we got up, as we grew older, as they moved away and went to different parts of Australia and all of that, quite a few of them aren't actively pursuing Jesus with their life anymore. And I think that is primarily because they weren't able to go into another community of discipleship. They weren't able to put themselves in a community where they had other people who were able to influence their faith. So they came away from the people who were helping point them to Jesus. And all of a sudden, they didn't have people helping shape and point their faith to Jesus. So during these times, they just slowly faded away in in their faith. And I believe many of them still believe strongly in Jesus, but they don't have that person helping them make it an active part of their life. And that's the tension we're looking at today, a community of disciples, which I know the Mildura Church of Christ is very much a community of disciples. Discipleship, because discipleship happens in community. Faith is grown in community. And we need to engage in community if we want to grow in our faith. I've learned off many people here. I reflect on my faith and story, and there's obviously people that had far more significant role in my life than um, it's not just all equal parts. Like my youth pastor, Tonks, as we said, a now senior pastor, had far more greater part than some other people played in my life and helping me shape towards Jesus. My parents and my Sunday school teachers at Adventure Club, they had very significant parts of my faith because they taught me so many of the basics of following Jesus. But then there's other people who just played small parts, but all of those parts were needed to help us have a mature well-rounded faith. Everyone had something to offer. So reality is it takes a community to do discipleship well. It takes community to do a discipleship well. Each doing our part and when their turn comes to play a role in someone's life and faith. So today to unpack and support this, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I share this with my youth leaders every year, but I'm looking at it a bit wider now and a bit more context behind it. But basically what we find is uh, 
Corinthians is a letter to a church that was in Corinth. And Paul wrote this letter to this church in Corinth. And it's the sort of letter you don't want to receive, this one. Some of the other churches get these good letters that sort of make you puff your chest out and feel pretty good about who you are. This one wasn't because he was, quite, he was rebu- rebuking them and trying to correct what they were doing. You see, this community in the town of Corinth, they were starting to look far too much like all the people in their town of Corinth who weren't following Jesus when they needed to be looking a lot more like Jesus so people could come to know Jesus through that church. So Paul writes him a letter and he talks about all these different things. And this is, uh, we're focusing on chapter verses 3, I think. No, chapter 3, verses 5 to 11. And we uh, pick it up here. But basically what he's doing is he's pointing out that these people are not following Jesus how they should. And that part of the reason for that is they're following Apollos, who was another friend of Paul's, and Paul more than Jesus. And you'll see what I mean as we go. From verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you, can, you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. So Paul highlights some significant leaders who discipled the Corinthians. But he identifies, hey, I know we discipled you, but we're nothing more than servants of the Lord. We aren't God ourselves. Don't follow us ahead of Jesus. You need to see us more as, um, more as glass that you look through and you see Jesus reflected because of us. You need to see Jesus, not us as the one you lead. Don't put us on a higher pedestal than what you put on Jesus. See, as we're leading people to Christ, as we're helping other people see Jesus, we need to make sure we stay humble. We need to remember that our role is Christ's servants. Because sometimes when people follow you and you're helping lead them to things like that, people will see you quite high. They'll see you as a very cool person. And we've got to make sure that we stay humble and remember we're serving Jesus. We're nothing more than servants of the Lord doing what he has called us to do. Paul continues, I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages wages according to the labour of each. See, Paul points out the roles they played in helping the church in Corinth. You know, I watered, I planted, Apollos watered different roles in different people's lives there. But only God gave it the growth. He keeps pointing all attention to God. So we can do the groundwork. We can do all the groundwork we want in people's lives. But we need to remember our role, we're pretty much, our role is to be the cultivators. Planting seeds, watering them, helping them be in the best environment they can to grow. We're trying to help people follow Jesus as best we can. Do the work, do the work, plant the ground, plant the seed, water the seed, help it grow. Yet God is the one who does the work of growth. So there's real freedom that comes with this because we are not solely responsible for a person's faith. I know growing up in ministry, there's times where I thought I was solely responsible for a person's faith. Growing up having a youth ministry, I remember starting thinking, gee, there's a lot of, it's a heavy load here because I'm responsible for these young people's faith, which is far from true. Unfortunately, I've learnt that over the time. But the reality is if we think like that, then we're going to feel a very heavy load when people walk away from Jesus. See, we need to know that we aren't the... End, end game of that. There's freedom that comes with knowing that God is the one that points people to Jesus in that. And that's the hardest part of discipling. A lot of people ask me over the last few weeks, what's the best part about your job? What's your favourite part? What's your favourite part? Not many people ask you about the hardest part. I don't know, they just don't want a conversation like that, I suppose. But I can tell you the hardest part of leading ministries and stuff like that is when you've led people in your youth group, in kids, and just in general ministry as well. And you've helped lead them to Christ and teach them about Jesus. And then years later, the last thing they care about is Jesus. The last thing they care about is their faith. And it's because, like Sandy said, being a good person isn't what saves us. Knowing Jesus is what saves us and brings us eternal life. He continues, For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid the foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose, with care, how to build on it. So again, cultivating, you know, talking about seeds and watering. Now he's using the idea of building on a firm foundation, building onto people's faith, teaching them different parts about Jesus. So Paul gives a powerful image of how community should look. He gives us a powerful image of how we are to be helping grow other people closer and closer to Jesus. His servants, all working together to do his work, to make Jesus known in other people's lives. We do this because we see, received his grace. We know that he came and gave his life for us, so we want to pass that on to others. One lays the foundation. Jesus, God, lays the foundation and another builds on it. So this is where I see the strength of how I was discipled. 
the foundation was laid. I came in and um, my parents, my Sunday school teachers, my youth pastor Tonks told me all these great things about Jesus. But then so many other people, mentors, people at Bible college, just other great people at this church started helping build on it, helping build different parts and helping shape my face, showing me different ways of looking at Jesus or different things about Jesus that I didn't know, helping shape the Bible, different parts that I didn't know. I was just trying to reflect on all the different people uh, that have had different shaping in my life. I remember I used to love just catching up and still do when I can with Doug Clark who just showed me so many lessons in humility and how to treat others and how to love others well. I remember people like Wayne Whitehead and Robin Horton who were really good telling me to pull my head in but, um, but also just telling me, showing me different things in their life about Jesus. Um, I remember like people like Jeanette Cook and the Kellys, Matt Cameron, I remember we used to sit at Macca's a lot after Adventure Club and we talk about the stories and the Bible and I could just go on and name probably point to everyone at church and just tell little bits about how you've had an impact on my life in my faith. But they're all different parts of different people building on a foundation, you see. They're all different parts of being in a discipling community. That doesn't mean you've got one person that you're catching up with once a week and all of this. That's good to do. But we're all investing into all the different people here. We're all playing our part. See, it wasn't one person. It was all these different people that showed me different parts of Jesus with their life and different ways of following Jesus. The final verse he says there, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, no matter what is built by all of these influences, the reality is, and what Paul is pointing out, he's pointing out the problem with these Corinthians. If your life's not built on Jesus and his teachings and his way, then your faith is useless. If our faith isn't on Jesus ahead of all of these different influences, then our faith will not last. We can only have faith in one person, and that is Jesus. We cannot have faith in people. And that's so important because the reality is people fumble. People stumble. People let people down, unfortunately. And across my life, I've seen so many people, so many leaders sadly fall away from Christ or stop practising their faith. And you see it sometimes when people, particularly prominent leaders like ministers or leaders of groups, when they fail and stumble, sometimes you see other people's faith affected by it so sadly. But that's because their faith, they're hurt by those people and their faith is quite tied in to those people and quite unfortunately it shakes their faith. So that's why we cannot have faith in people. That's why Apollos and Paul are saying, you can't have your faith in us. It has to be in Jesus. Jesus must be our foundation because he's the only one that doesn't fail. He's the only one that our faith can actually be sustained on. He came into the world because he saw that people were fumbling, that people were stumbling, that people weren't able to measure up to God's standards. So that's why he came into the world, because he saw that nobody could be perfect. He came down because he saw people were constantly choosing their way over God's way. So he came down from heaven into earth, which is what we celebrate at Christmas, and lived a perfect life, lived a life without stumbling lived a life completely dedicated to others, teaching others about the kingdom of God and living for God and loving so many. This meant he was able to be a sacrifice to restore everyone back to God. He would be sent to the cross and to do this, he was made a sacrifice for all of us. When he was hung on that cross, he was being the sacrifice for every time we didn't obey God, for every time people before and people after now don't obey God. Three days later, he would rise again from the dead, defeating death, defeating sin and thus being worthy is the only foundation that we can build our life on. Because he's the only one that never failed and he's the only one that can bring us back to God. No person can, you can put your faith in has done that. There is no person capable of that in this world. So our responsibility now comes to revealing all he did to others so he can be that foundation for others too. So other people can be on a proper foundation, not a dodgy foundation. We need to build it on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That means our faith cannot be shaken. It says in Psalm 16, verses 8 and 9, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in his safety. That's the assurance that you get when you build your life on Jesus. And you can continue to build on that because you have a strong foundation in Jesus. So in light of all that, what are the little application points that I'm going to share just to finish up. What are the things that are going to help you as the Mildura Church across community? I'm sort of speaking to you as a whole here, but then each part of us playing that part. And I don't have a heap to share because you're doing a pretty good job. There's just a few little things. How do we be a community like that? How do we be a community that you were for me? How do you continue to be that community that is continuing just to 
build different parts for different people so that someone can come here and have a similar experience of being ministered to by so many different people. And it goes both ways. It goes from the community to minister to those people, but the people that need to be ministered to need to put some work in as well. And I've just got three small minor points here just to put in. But we need to be an open and inviting community. We must be an open and inviting community. If people ever come through this door and feel like nobody talked to them, no one sat with them, or they sat in a spot they weren't supposed to, or even as little as not knowing where they were supposed to go, they may never come back. They won't get the chance to experience the community. So the way that we are inviting to others, it might not even be a way of saying, well, you're like, oh, that's not telling about Jesus, but it's bringing them in to feel comfortable where we go. Social anxiety is higher than ever in, ever in the world today. People are more socially anxious than ever. So we have to make sure when they step into a place, a foreign place where they don't know everyone, that they are invited and they feel welcome and they're so keen to come back. The third one, no, second one, sorry, is we need to embrace being an intergenerational community. And Tonks pointed this out well just when he was doing the welcome. We had a kids program and so many churches don't have kids programs. I think one of the best powers of our church is we are intergenerational. I look out in this thing and I see young people. Um, I see people that are falling asleep because I'm not exciting. I see older people that are falling asleep because I'm not exciting. Um, But I also see a whole range of ages. And that is one of the blessings in my life. I'd have people that are... 20, like people I'm leading in youth group that have been able to play a part in my life. I've had people in their 90s be able to play a part in my life. I've had people that are older than me who have followed Jesus twice as long as I've been alive able to tell me about their faith. So my advice for that or encouragement for that is to embrace that. Make sure you're still doing that. But in doing that, don't just step out and find... um, Hang out with your age group. Make sure you're hanging out and you're being ministered to by people of different ages. I've learnt so much from the young people in my youth group and the kids in Kidsmen, just the stuff they come up with, the questions they ask. um, Some of them are deep theological concepts that you have to wrestle with because of the questions they ask. This is one of my favourite photos. It's terribly blurry because I probably had a Sony Ericsson at the time and um, camera camera phones have come a long way. But um, this was just... We used to do these leadership days. You can tell it was a while ago because it's back when we had... Um, a very different looking church. And for those that don't know, that's Doug Clark. I remember taking this photo, and I still love this photo, because it's this guy who's in his 90s, or he probably was in his 80s at that point, uh, ministering to these young guys. And you've got Isaac Fabich, Maddie Tonkin, Josh Tonkin, and Ethan Tonkin. He could have been telling a joke, but usually whatever Doug says is usually full of heaps of wisdom. So I know he was telling them something pretty powerful. And um, we've got those four young people are all doing great things. Isaac's doing um, incredible musician and did incredible stuff with the worship at our church and we'll be doing that wherever he goes. Um, Ethan's a school teacher and does incredible work with our youth leaders. Uh, Maddie, you can see, is doing incredible stuff with our worship ministry and just today leading um, us through worship so well. And Josh Tonkin, as I mentioned him earlier, doing so many great things through kids' men. And we just can't take for granted moments like that where older people are investing into us. People wiser than us are investing into us. People that have been going to church for longer than we've been alive, investing into us. So my advice with that too, though, is seek it out. Because there's this sort of a standoff with people. Older people think, oh, younger people don't want to hear from me. Younger people would be intimidated or think, oh, I don't know if I want to hear from that. So just really get into it. Really try and seek out older people in your life. Our youth ministry, the oldest person was me. And now I think the next oldest person is going to be Jono. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of age above that. So looking for that older people can bring in so much value. As I reflected on the people that I got the most wisdom out of, they weren't my youth leaders that I had during the time. They were actually a lot of just older people at church who were in their 50s and their 60s that I just got to see continually following Jesus long after they were in their 20s and 30s. So my advice to that is just to continue to bridge that gap of gener- that generational gap. Don't see, make sure you see intergenerational diversity as a real strength and something that you can continue to build on. And my main advice with that is when you're different generations and you think things are stupid because younger kids are wearing it like that and the younger generation think that the old people look stupid because they're wearing things that they don't think are cool, all that sort of stuff, don't worry about the differences. Just embrace what you can learn from each other. Encourage, encourage, encourage. So we can build walls up when we just sort of use sarcasm and pick on each other's differences. We can gain so much when we just encourage, encourage, encourage. And my last and final point of that 
think it's here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Step into, be the one to take the step. So none of this will work. Not, you could be in this community, but if you just sit back and wait to be ministered to, you won't get the full part of this community. You won't get to embrace getting to know people. So this means taking the step out and saying, I want to be involved in this. It means taking the step out and just going to different events that are running at the church, serving at different events that are running at the church. Just helping yesterday at my lane sale. I've always loved helping at the lane sale. So I just get to meet so many different people to be in, in our church. I remember this guy called Wally who would just take me to different people's houses and we'd chat drive in the car and um, I'd meet all these different people from church. So be the one to step in and be happy to do all of these different things. Put yourself in positions where you're making the step out to, put, to be ministered to by other people. So it's so easy just to do the things we like to do. It's so easy just to hang out with the people we know, the people we like, but step out and just be willing to maybe have a cup of coffee with someone you've never sat to or spoken to at church. Step out and use um, the confidence that you might have and say, oh, can you tell me something about why you're still a follower of Jesus? You know, not just a hi, how are you going, but just a real a question that will make them think and be encouraged. But you might learn something really important about faith there as well. But be the one to take the step. It's really awkward, I know that. We all feel the awkwardness when it comes to doing something like that. But just embrace the awkwardness. Be the one to step out into that. And I can guarantee, especially at this church, you will be blessed. It will help shape you in wonderful ways. That's how I was shaped, just stepping in and trying all these different things, helping it different things and different events, and you'll get to know so many different people because of it. The reality is this church is far from perfect. The Gisborne Church of Christ is far from perfect where I'm going. This church in Corinth is far, far from perfect. I had an extra far, but if we got a letter from Paul, who knows? But um, in all my searching, I've yet to find a perfect church. I don't know if I've seen the perfect... I've looked at a lot of YouTube videos over the years, particularly since 2020, and I'm yet to find the perfect church. You always find something that you don't like about a church. You always find things that one church is bad at, one church is good at. So my advice is to strive to be the best church that you can be. But just accept that you won't be perfect. But don't let that stop you. Don't go looking for the perfect church or trying to necessarily nitpick because of that. Just embrace the community that you're in and try and strive and make this church better by continually pointing people to Jesus. Point the people in that community to Jesus. So there's so many little bits of advice that I could share. But all I really want you to remember is just be that community that the Mildura Church of Christ was for me to others. Be that community so that when people enter a community like this, they can have a faith that will last and produce fruit to so many different people. Ensure that it's always the foundation you're building on as well. We're not leading people to ourselves, but we're constantly pointing and giving Jesus all the credit. As you disciple, ensure that you're getting closer and closer to him in your own life. So you can't just point people to Jesus and forget to worry about your own faith. Strive after Jesus yourself and help other people strive after Jesus. And if you're the sole discipler of someone, remember, you're doing them a disservice. It's re- you're doing a really good job there, but make sure you're bringing other people in to their lives so that they are seeing Jesus from different eyes, from different people, and becoming a well-rounded disciple. When I first stumbled into Dom's Cafe, which was first located next to the post office and that, I actually wasn't going looking for my favourite barista. I wasn't thinking, oh, this is going to be my favourite barista. I'm going to go to his coffee shop and spend way too much money over here years. And well over 10 years later, we know each other quite well. But what I learnt is when he closed his coffee shop just recently, or all those other times where he closed it for a little bit of a gap, I didn't go, oh, I'm not going to drink coffee anymore. That's the last time that I'm going to have a coffee because my favourite barista isn't there. Nobody does it quite like Dom, which is true, but um, I don't stop drinking coffee. Guess what? I still go to cafes, probably a little bit too regularly. I still make coffee at home. Um, I still drink coffee all the time because I love coffee. That's the passion. That's the thing that I want to go to. That's the main thing when it comes to cafes. So that's the thing that we need to remember when it comes to churches, when it comes to people leaving, when it comes to being a minister to other people in their life. We need to be like, how I'm actually after coffee and I'll meet different baristas over my life and have people that have um, significant relationship dudes because of their providing that service to me. That coffee is the main thing there. So as we go to churches, as we grow in faith, we're going to have a number of different people to cycle us, a number of different people point us to Jesus in different ways. We need to remember that Jesus is the main thing that we keep going back for, that Jesus is where our foundation is, and Jesus is the one we want to continually see through other people. We want Jesus to be the main thing. We always need to keep the main thing the main thing, is what Andy Stanley always says. Paul and Apollos were clear, clearly, Incredible disciples. They're clearly incredible proclaimers of Jesus. 
They saw the issue was people going to them over the gospel. So they were ensuring that people would continue. When they saw this, they're like, no, 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 don't follow me. Don't follow me, follow Christ. He's the reason we're doing this. You need to follow Christ ahead of us. My prayer is that mine and my family's departure is the same. People will come and go. There's people here, I can tell you, Doug Clark, his picture's not there anymore. The amount of ministers he's seen come and go over his time at this church, he's seen many come in and go. He'll talk so highly about so many and the impact that they made. So my prayer for our departure is that people will come and go and we just appreciate the part that different people's lives played here. We're going to go away and there'll be different people that play other parts in our life and we'll be so grateful for the different way that those people shape us. But Christ will never leave us. He is the one we must proclaim at the end of the day. And he is the one that we always want to keep our eyes on. He's the primary reason that we have these kind of relationships because if it wasn't for Jesus, um, the church would be nothing more than a social club, would it? So as people reflect on mine and Lisa's time, I want them to acknowledge that we played just a part in leading them closer to Jesus, just a very small part, that it wasn't us that actually were the sole reason that they come to church and follow Jesus, but that we were just a part contributing to them coming to know Jesus greater. A prayer that I, my favourite prayer that I've got, or verse in the Bible I should say, is he must become greater, I must become less. And that's what we all need to be like. He must become greater, we must become less. That people see him more and more and more through us and less and less and less of us. I'm about to pray and we're going to sing the song, Build My Life. And that song is talking about exactly what we're talking about. I will build my life on the love of Christ. That is my firm foundation. And nothing else that you build on will be sustainable except for that. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We just thank you for the Mildura Church of Christ. We just thank you for the community of disciples that make up the Mildura Church of Christ. We just pray that you can continue to encourage these people here to be disciples to be building on people's foundation, that foundation of you, so that they can see Jesus. Pray that you can help anyone here identify if they are leading people to themselves and not to Christ and help them be able to point those people completely to you. Help these people continue to be an open, inviting community. Help these people be able to point people to Jesus just like they pointed me to Jesus. We just pray that you can be with the Mildura Church of Christ and help them to be a light in the community of Sunraysia, so they are leading not just people that are part of this church, but people in this region, that they are fulfilling their calling, they are bringing people closer and closer to you, and that they are showing people how important it is to build their life on the foundation of Christ. It is in your wonderful, mighty name we pray. Amen.